All right. Today is Sunday, the 4th of June. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. We begin with what else? The tape this week. And the reason is a huge change appears to be taking place. And this change could be legitimate and it could lead to a broader market rally that is more inclusive and comes with more conviction. Or it could be a rug pull operation where they're trapping a lot of newcomers into the stock market and then pulling the rug aggressively. Let's take it one step at a time and talk about NVIDIA. We know the stock is the top performer for this year. It is the poster boy of the AI mania. But the retail mom and pop investor has been absent from the NVIDIA rally. In a previous video, I showed you how in 21, the insiders bought NVIDIA stock. And then when the retail mom and pops, the Johnny come lately's, caught up to the action and started buying NVIDIA, that was pretty much the top in 21. And the stock went down aggressively. So these are the kind of signs that we look for to spot market tops and reversals, in certain stocks at least. So the retail crowd, the mom and pops, were not participating in the rally in NVIDIA. Until, of course, the post-earnings pump. Now, all of a sudden, we have a stampede. We have a gold rush among the retail mom and pops community chasing these AI stocks, including NVIDIA, which is a warning sign that this is perhaps coming to an end. In the same video, I also shared with you that a classic and a reliable sign for a topping for any individual stock is the so-called analyst community. They come out Johnny come lately, scrambling to lift price targets and upgrading the stock after the fact and accompanying their upgrades with obnoxious commentary. And this is what we call the absurdity stage, and it is a classic topping signal. Listen to some of the headlines that we got recently. Here's one that says why NVIDIA's boom isn't a bubble morning brief. Oh, really? Here's another one. It says NVIDIA stock is the most overbought in 18 months. But that doesn't mean the rally is over. Oh, really? The Wall Street Journal says NVIDIA is still a buy on Wall Street as analysts race to boost price targets. Here comes the Johnny Come Latelys. Forbes goes as far as saying that NVIDIA will still surpass Apple's valuation. Now, please do the math. The yearly revenue for Apple versus the yearly revenue for NVIDIA. It's not even close. But this is how clownish things get in the absurdity stage. Another classic topping signal is once a hype or a bubble has begun and the retail mom and pops and other institutions feel like they missed out. A classic sign of a topping in a hype cycle is we see those missing out chasing alternatives in a speculative frenzy. Which company will be the next NVIDIA? And let's pump that one and get the valuations out of hand. And now even the Wall Streeters, Morgan Stanley, for example, says that this stock provides a cheaper way to play NVIDIA's AI boom. Bank of America says, buy this little-known software stock that can rally 80% on strong AI demand. And they're talking about AYX Ultrix, which is bullshit, of course. They're just pumping here, sucking a lot of people in. And then whatever happens, happens. It's a gold rush. It's a frenzy that reaching a climax stage. And this is a really important term. We'll talk about that in a second because a lot of folks assume it's a joke. It's not a joke. It's an actual terminology that describes one of the most reliable topping patterns. We'll talk about that in a second, but here it is. Bloomberg says retail traders look beyond NVIDIA for next AI bits. FOMO looks to be kicking in, according to Vanda's Marco Lacini, who said individual investors are now looking beyond the large cap stocks, which were initial targets, because they missed out. And now it becomes an irrational speculation frenzy. The day trading crowd has piled into the likes of Palantir Technologies, Marvel Technologies, and UPath, pushing in millions over the past week, data from Vanda Research show. That comes that the trio rallies in the wake of NVIDIA's blowout results blowout results really you mean the outlook that nobody can confirm right now and wall street mavens from steve cohen to stan drunkenmiller tout the technology's potential because they're johnny come lately's they want to hype it make a quick buck and pass the bags to the retail mom and pops while retail traders are still snapping up shares of nvidia they have plowed 285 million dollars into the company over the five day span the activity is unlikely this is really important it's unlikely to kickstart another leg higher for the company, according to the Chini. Past episodes of uh, thematic buying around similar large cap names led us to believe retail traders will show greater propensity to buy less popular AI related firms, for which they perceive upside potential is greater. Classic sign for a topping formation. And of course, 
Forget about the Johnny Come Latelys, the Chasers, the Hypers, the Monkeys, the Donkeys, the Idiots, the Bulls, the Bears, the Giraffes. All of that doesn't matter. What matters is the dinosaurs. Traders such as uh, Art Cashin, for example, who's been trading since the South Sea bubble, so he probably knows a thing or two. But nobody wants to listen to these boomers. They're just jealous of the gains, brah. But he says the AI hype gripping the stock market will resemble a miniature dot-com bubble. I do agree. And I think when this bubble pops, everybody's going to realize that we have been in a bear market, not a bull market. We have just experienced a mini bubble within a bear market. And this bubble took place in the largest market cap stocks and therefore the distortion. But let's talk about climax for a little bit because it is an important terminology. It indicates the exhaustion stage in any hype mania rally. Let's read and see if the conditions are applicable to what we have today. Traders have been trying to pick tops for generations, knowing the profit potential when selling short at the end of an uptrend, but the majority of predictions fail as the security regains its bullish composure and breaks out to higher highs. It is unfortunate because tops can be predicted with surprising accuracy, as long as they generate technical attributes that point to considerably lower prices. What are they talking about? Consider the emotional dynamics in play at these turning points. A downtrend finally ends, yielding higher prices in a series of rallies that attract a lot of market participants. Sentiment shifts steadily throughout the ramping process, with excessive bearishness replaced first by cautious optimism, and then by greed that eventually yields excessive bullishness. This euphoric state generates risk blindness that encourages weak hands to buy the security at higher and higher prices. Are you listening or not? often lifting it to all time highs that present no overhead resistance. Trends can escalate even further at this point, entering a blow-off or climax phase that sets off warning signals, telling observant technicians the rally is probably coming to an end. The highest volume in a security's history often prints during this manic phase, with the last supply of sidelines bulls jumping on board and generating overbought technical conditions that signal the evaporation of buying pressure, which could also be known as the greater fool theory. In turn, the security reverses sharply, dropping into trading range that signals a period of active selling by strong hands, while weak hands hold on tightly, eventually providing highly efficient fuel for a new downtrend. Why is that the case? Because when they buy, and they buy the top, maybe they feel a bit good for a day or two as the stock rallies another 5-6% higher, but then it goes down, and they sit on, let's say, 3-4% to losses, and they don't capitulate. They believe the stock will go higher, and they hold hoodle hodl diamond hands, not realizing that they just bought at the top. And then as the strong hands sell and the security goes down, these new buyers start to capitulate and this generates new fuel, a new aggressiveness, a rug pull kind of flush to the downside. Now this is really important, distribution patterns, and we are reading from investing.com by the way. The climax phase is not required for forming a top, but provides additional support to the topping process when it occurs. Climatic behavior can unfold in less than obvious ways, with vertical price action that doesn't yield extraordinary volume or high volume prints without vertical price action. In all cases, it is important to note that the last phase of an uptrend always marks the first phase of the subsequent trading range, with early retracements setting mathematical and emotional parameters for the evolving pattern. And therefore, some would argue that the opportunity in shorting these names, not in the first leg down, because we see the first leg down, the topping in the first leg down, and then the stock consolidates in the range. That is the opportunity to short because the implied volatility goes down and then we see the next leg the capitulation leg from the new buyers that is why smart technicians watch price action relative to the first reversal as the trading range evolves looking for evidence of aggressive selling behavior consistent with a trend climax the depth of the retracement may offer additional clues in the pattern's bearishness or bearish future direction, with a 100% retracement of the last rally leg signaling a first failure event often seen in significant tops. So when do we have the short entry? Here it is. A breakdown from a topping pattern should print higher than average volume and drop the security well below obvious support. Small penetrations of support, especially when the trading range is still carving through rapid price swings, are more likely to indicate stop running by predatory algorithmic programs than the emotional behavior of shareholders realizing they're trapped in a new downtrend. 
Finding a low short entry price can be difficult when breakdown levels are not clearly delineated. That encourages short sellers to choose from a basket of strategies. You can't get the timing precisely right, so you have to have different strategies, different hedging. Some want to wait to see the sign already happening with the confirmation and then they hop into the action. But by doing so, they miss the first 30 to 40 percent and they end up overpaying for the premiums. But then you have traders who want to short ahead of time before the reversal happens. And the reason is they want to get the best price for the short and therefore they need different strategies. And these are depending on the patterns quality and the number of support levels in play. In general, this translates into early positions when the pattern look perfect. Chasing lower prices when a catalyst triggers a breakdown and waiting for the security to pull back the resistance when a fast moving market doesn't permit risk conscious momentum entry. In other words, you got the initial bet. Those take place when the pattern forms, like we have right now in NVIDIA, for example. But the entry is happening via increments. That is increment number one. Increment number two is when a support line is violated. Increment number three, when the chart rebounds in the retest of a resistance, gets rejected and it goes down to break another support level. And that's increment number three. So this is how shorts, professional shorts at least, divide the trade because nobody can time it exactly right. Now, when we look at NVIDIA's chart, a daily chart, what do we see here? We do have the topping pattern, but most importantly, we have the OBV, which stands for unbalanced volume. It is not a widely used indicator, but it is used in spotting tops. What we look for is a topping in that volume, a rollover. Once you start to see the volume rolling over, this is when you know the top is in and down we go. It appears for now not confirmed yet, but it does appear that the OBV in NVIDIA is topping out and rolling over. And if that is the case, then we do indeed have the top in NVIDIA. And perhaps another topping sign is psychological. When I read the comments from certain viewers, who I call the uh, pussy bears, out of love, of course, because they've been short throughout the year, and now they're capitulating. But what are they buying? They're chasing the AI hype. And for example, on Friday, they bought NVIDIA right at the open. And we know that NVIDIA went down. It was one of the few laggards for the session. And the winners were actually the rotation trades, the cyclicals, the industrials, the banks, the metals, the Dylan Mulvini ETF. So if you wanted to chase, if you were feeling FOMO, if you've been watching the show, The Maverick of Wall Street, you would have put two and two together and bought the dips in the most bruised, most battered, most unloved names. Those are the ones who benefit from the rotation. You don't chase topping patterns. But it is a classic sign that the weakest bears start to capitulate. When they capitulate, they chase exactly the same names that are forming tops, not the names that are about to benefit from a rotation from the winners to the losers, courtesy of the institutional investor. They book profits from the winners, the AI mania, they hand the bags to the retail mom and pops to the pussy bears who are capitulating, and they use the profits to buy the laggards. So understanding the psychology is really important. But unfortunately, most people don't want to listen. Most people want to listen to the crap on TikTok and Twitter and chase bullshit, not actual facts. Anyhow, NVIDIA aside, let's revisit the Maverick conditions to short with both hands. A reminder, number one, a fundamental reversal. So whatever tailwind that initiated the hype and the mania is either exposed as fake or we see headwinds, coming headwinds, overshadowing and overcoming tailwinds. The question becomes, did we see any of that this week? The answer is absolutely not. Nothing re-NVIDIA, nothing re-AI, nothing that forms some sort of a wall against the hype. Nothing from the Fed, as we will talk about in a minute. Now, do we have a technical reversal? We're looking for extended weekly hour size and a reversal candle. When we look at the NASDAQ, for example, the Q's a weekly chart, what do we see here? Do we have a reversal candle? The answer is not quite. Do we have an elevated RSI? The answer is absolutely. Which means when this reverses, it's going to be one aggressive flush down kind of a move. Some traders would refer to it as a rug pull, and that could take us down to 320, 300, who knows. But the higher the chart goes in this elevated RSI with no pullbacks at all, the sharper the pullback. So in this case, we can say that we have an elevated RSI, but we don't have any topping or a reversal candle. We'll look at condition number three, a mechanical reversal. Extreme call options positioning plus big unusual short bets. Now, I would say that we are seeing this happening right now. Maybe we're not seeing the big unusual short bets yet, 
There are some, but not plenty. But most importantly, we look at the five day average put to call ratio. A lot of you repeat the garbage online, the fantasies blindly, with no regard to the facts at all. Oh, there are too many bears in the market, Maverick. Oh, there is a lot of put options volume. All of this is trash, it's garbage, and it's not real. In reality, what we're seeing right now is extreme call options buying with puts pretty much non-existent. And the last time we have seen such readings, at least recently, it was during the 22 bear market rally top in August and this year's February 23 reversal when we got the news about inflation not cooling down and we were supposed to go down to the October bottom. But then came the SVB collapse and with it, hopes for a Fed pivot and that ignited another leg in the rally, a reversal and a recovery. So all in all, I would say we don't have any fundamental reversal yet. We might get it next week, who knows? Do we have a technical reversal? The answer is not quite. We have about 85% of what we need to see. We're just waiting for the other 15. What is the other 15, Maverick? It's a reversal candle, a loss of an important support. Number three, do we have the mechanical reversal? The answer is yes, we have what we need to see to say, okay, the risk versus reward says book profits and start shorting. If you happen to be long only, start hedging. Now let's look at the weekly indicators and see what the market says. And again, a reminder, we look at the NASDAQ, then we look at the SMH chips, then we look at the XLY for consumer discretionary, then we look at the XRT retail, the breadth and divergences. If you look at the NASDAQ, in this case the Qs, it is still bullish. There's no sign that this is changing whatsoever. We look at the monthly chart, now we have a confirmation because we have a crossing in the MACD indicator. So for now, the chart says the NASDAQ is bullish. And we do have finally a confirmation of that. Will it last? That's a different story. But for now, we have to take the sign as it is. It is bullish. It goes into the bull camp. Then we'll look at the SMH, still bullish. We'll look at the monthly chart. Here it is. We have a confirmation in the MACD. Could it be a lower high? Could it be a reverse ABC pattern? Who knows? But for now, looking at the chart, we know that we have a confirmation that it is bullish. Then we'll look at the XLY. It is the laggard. But is it recovering a little bit? Sure, we have seen some progress this week, but it remains bearish. So this is going to be in the bear's camp, but it is moving a little bit away from the bear camp toward the bullish camp. Is it enough to say it's bullish? Not really. And I'll tell you the reason in a minute, but the same goes for the XRT. The XRT is in the bear camp, but also moving toward becoming bullish. Not even close right now, but moving away from the bear camp, at least for this week. We look at the chart for XRT monthly chart. Here it is. We got a green candle for now so far in June. Is it going to last? Is it not going to last? That's a different story. But for now, is it better than the red candle uh, loss of another support? Of course it is. Then we look at the breadth. It remains bearish, but we have some improvement. This is moving slightly but surely toward the bullish camp, at least based on the action from this week. I'll tell you the catch in a minute, but when we look at the breadth, at least in the five days, the five past days that is, we can see that every sector joined the rally this week. It was more inclusive, so the breadth is improving. When we look at the sectors of the S&P again, led by information technology, led by actual technology, and led by the consumer discretionary, thanks to Amazon and Tesla. But we know that this is due to the AI mania. The rest of the market is crashing down. But did we see an improvement this week, at least this week, that was? The answer is absolutely yes. We see firming up in all of the other sectors. But we're not seeing the winner sectors, technology, communication services, IYR, moving down. So for now, we're not seeing quite the rotation yet. What we're seeing is buying of the laggards. The managers are becoming more emboldened now, more confident. This is a market that's going higher, not lower, and they're deploying capital. Could they be wrong? The answer is absolutely. When we see these kind of phenomenons, when a new month begins, we see capital allocation and stocks start to move rapidly higher, 3, 4, 5% in a single day. And then we get hit with a catalyst. And this catalyst negates the dip buying the money managers have been doing since the month began. For example, we have seen some buying in energy, in metals, in industrials, and in the Chinese names. A lot of managers say that we've made a lot of money from the big caps and the AI mania. And now we have to chase the laggards who should catch up because we are in a bull market, because we're going to have the soft landing. At least this is what they believe in right now. So they bought Chinese stocks, industrials, metals, oil, etc., etc. Then comes next week and we get bad news from China and they start dumping and booking profits quickly. And then the rotation, which is not happening by the way, but at least on paper it is, 
to the non-experienced observer might be a trap. It might be a fool signal that, hey, it is safe. We're seeing the rotation. The managers are buying the laggards. You got to follow suit only to find out that it is a trap. So how do we know that the rotation is legit? When you see the laggards moving higher and catching a bid on the expense of the winners, meaning money coming out at a larger scale, not the smaller scale we've been seeing so far, but a larger scale from the AI mania and the big caps, and moving into the laggards, because that portrays conviction. Otherwise, if they're just deploying capital to buy dips in the laggards, then it is a low conviction move. Keep that in mind. Now we look at the NASDAQ, it is blasting higher, it is in a breakout. Yet when we look at the advance to decline line, it is absolutely abysmal. It means that the majority of names in the NASDAQ are actually trading down. But the index is moving higher based on the over-representation of a handful of stocks, the big caps. So again, all in all, the breadth is bearish still, but it is moving a little bit away from the bearish camp toward the bullish camp. And the same goes for divergences. After the so-called rotation, which is yet to be confirmed, a lot of divergences are being fixed, at least for now. We look at the Morningstar leveraged loan index that I shared with you last week. It appears that it is perking up higher. Is it conclusive yet? No, it is not, but it is a lot better than last week's readings. Then we'll look at the Qs in white versus the IWM in orange. While the IWM was the laggard, this week it managed to pop higher. It moved hand in hand with the Qs. But is it enough or is it just a one-week wonder? That remains to be seen. And the same goes for Qs in white and then copper in orange. And as you can see, finally we're seeing copper moving higher along with the cues, as they supposed to. But is it enough? Once again, that remains to be seen. The point from showing you all of this is, if it is indeed that, oh, the NASDAQ was right, the NASDAQ was not lying, and it is the IWM and copper in this case, are the ones that are about to do the catching up process, then where is the opportunity? Is it in chasing the cues, the big caps, and NVIDIA, or is it in closing the gap between the underperformers and the outperformers? In this case, in buying copper, in buying the IWM. Here's another one. HYG, junk bonds. This week, moving higher along with the Qs. Is it enough? Of course not. But if the gap is to be closed by the HYG catching up with the Qs, then the opportunity is indeed in buying the HYG, not the Qs. Now, if the action is a trap and a throw-off, and the Qs is the one that ran ahead of itself, and needs to go down to catch up with the HYG and copper and the IWM. And the opportunity is in shorting the queues. This is really important stuff, but I know most of you are not paying attention right now. Here's another divergence, the queues versus the two-year queues in white and the two-year yield in orange. These are supposed to be moving in opposite directions, but now they're moving hand in hand, which is weird and strange. And one of these two is lying. Is it the queues or the two-year yield? The two-year moving higher, indicating the Fed will do more. But if that is the case, shouldn't the queues go down? Or is it the queues telling the truth? And then we see the two-year crashing down. For now, this divergence persists. If we look at another one, here it is. The queues in white versus the IYT, the transportation index in orange. You cannot say that we have a bull market if the IYT transportation is not participating. But at least in the past week, the IYT did participate by moving higher along with the queues. So again, if the queues was not lying and the IYT was just waiting for a Fed pause, for example, then is the opportunity in chasing the queues or chasing the underperformer IYT to close the gap with the queues? Something you need to think about. Now, if it is a trap and the queues been lying and rallying based on false premises, then the queues will come down along with the IYT and the rest of them. So how do we know which is which, Maverick? Let's talk macro. And we begin, of course, with the CDS. These are the insurance plays for the default risk and of course, now that we have a deal, they came down crashing. The problem is, now that we have a deal, Janet Yellen will have to replenish the Treasury's accounts with cash, meaning new issuance of bonds. And we're talking about $1 trillion worth of issuance. The last time we have seen such a surge in the cash balance of the Treasury, it took place in the bear market of 22, as liquidity was drained from the equities market while the Treasury issued hundreds of billions of dollars worth of new bonds. And this was a result of the Fed tightening the monetary policy. If we're going to see that, if we see a huge shoot up higher in the treasury balance, then you know that there is a massive liquidity drain coming in the equities market. 
Now you look at the chart and you look at the facts that now we have a deal and the treasury has a lot of catching up to do. It is almost a certainty that the operating balance of the treasury will shoot up higher. Now they can do it in a controlled way, in increments for example, but at the end of the day, it's going to be a lot of catching up to do and it's going to suck liquidity out of the equities market. So we just looked at the divergences, for example, improving between the Qs and uh, the IWM, copper, etc. But if we're going to talk about this as a trap and a false signal, then the evidence must be, hey, it is a false signal because the Treasury is about to dump a massive amount of bonds and it's going to suck liquidity away from equities. So they're all going to go down. The Qs, of course, they're topping. The AI main and NVIDIA, that's topping. And the relief rally that we got in cyclicals, in oil, in industrials, in metals, that will be short-lived. For people who say that, this is an important evidence that supports their theory. Now, let's talk Fed for a bit, because it all depends on the Fed. Whatever the Fed does, we're going to see either the rotation from the winners to the losers, and we see another leg higher in the SPY, or we see the entirety of the stock market pulling back. We talked about how the Fed declared that inflation is over prematurely. Of course, they did not say that officially, but actions speak louder than words. And despite the mounting evidence for them to do a 25 basis points, getting a cover from the equities market, the bond market, and the odds, the Fed refuses to take the bait. And instead, they say, oh, we're going to skip. We're not going to pause, but we're going to skip. Playing with words, doing the funny business again. And we said that this is all happening while the employment report is not even out yet. How could they have any certainty that the jobs report will be supportive to their skipping decision? Well, they didn't, because the employment report that we got on Friday was supposedly at least extra hot and the jobs created they were not just in leisure and hospitality they were in healthcare, professional business services government construction transportation retail whether you believe these numbers or not we have a downward revision from the last readings worth about 97,000 jobs so according to the kitchen of the bureau of labor statistics analysis whatever they gave us an excess of 97,000 fake jobs in the last few reports. So can you trust anything they're giving us right now? Of course not. But we have to roll with it because we have no other choice. Overall, the U.S. economy added 339,000 jobs for the month, better than the 190,000 jobs Dow Jones estimate and marking the 29th straight month of positive jobs growth. But perhaps here's the uh, good news for the Fed. While the economy smashed expectations of job creation, magically, the unemployment rate actually went higher from 3.5% to 3.7%. And the jobless rate was the highest since October of 22. And of course, now they say that this is the strangest employment report for some time. Of course, it is the strangest because it's cooked. It's not real. How could you create more jobs than expectations, smashing expectations almost by double? And then the unemployment rate goes higher and uh, wage inflation ticks down by a little bit. Something doesn't add up here. Yet what really matters is what the Fed is about to do. It doesn't matter what the facts say, whether the jobs report is hot or not, whether inflation is hot or not. If the Fed chooses to ignore all of these, then it is what it is. And if the Fed decides to pause, then we will get into the risk of the 1970s scenario. In other words, Jerome Powell channeling his inner uh, Arthur Burns. And the two kind of look alike, don't they? What will be the end result from a pause, at least according to my perspective? The market will become more confident about the prospect of a soft landing. A rotation will occur out of technology and into the lagging cyclical side of the market. In other words, if the Fed is indeed about to pause, and they're not going to say pause, they're going to say skip, but it doesn't matter. The market will actually read it as a cut. If you're skipping now, next thing you pause, and then they're going to start cutting. But will the opportunity be in the winners, the AI mania, the big caps? Of course not. This will actually cause a rotation into the IWM, the cyclicals, the laggards, and the opportunity will be the same opportunity that we've seen in the fourth quarter of 2020, when the big caps topped installed became stagnant for a little while which side of the market caught a bit due to the jabs coming out the iwm the reopening names the cyclical side of the stock market are we about to see the same my hunch is yes if we do have a pause whether they call it a pause or not it doesn't matter it is effectively a pause now, if the Fed decides to go with another hike of 25 basis points in the next meeting, then the market will have to cope with the Fed hiking higher for longer to achieve the 2% target for inflation. The end effect of that is the dollar and yields spiking higher, causing money to get out of equities and seek risk-free returns and fixed income during the second half of the year. So the money comes out of technology. That's the end effect in either scenario. 
So technology is the loser. The question becomes, will the money chase the laggards? That will be the case in the pause scenario. Or will the money chase cash, treasuries, and money market funds? That would be in the hike scenario. For now, the odds say that we have a 75% chance that we're not going to have a 25 basis points hike comes the next meeting. It's going to be a pause, a skip, whatever you want to call it. So for now, the pause is winning. And perhaps this is why we've seen in at least uh, Thursday's and Friday's sessions, the cyclical side of the stock market at performing. The dips are being bought in oil, metals, industrials, banks. And one might come under the assumption that this is indeed a legitimate rotation. But is it confirmed? The answer is not quite. What are you talking about, Maverick? Let's move on to the strategy. Look at the XME, the ETF for metals, versus the dollar. They have an inverse relationship. This week, the dollar and the XME moved higher. One of these two is lying. In other words, the relief rally that we got in metals on Thursdays and Fridays sessions is not confirmed yet. It will be confirmed if the dollar indeed moves down. But for now, it could be the XME and the rebound of cyclicals, a formation for trap. But assume we have the pause scenario and we stick to our rotation. Again, you want to pick the losers. And we have a lot of them that started to move higher this week. Look at industrial names such as Eaton, such as Caterpillar, Deer. All of these names caught a massive bid this week. Well, we go back to the strategy from the last weekly video. And we went over a strategy looking at a bunch of charts. And the assumption was now that we have a dead deal, the two year and the Dixie will go down. And indeed they went down. And this is supposed to be good for dividend paying names, good for the defensives, the laggards and the stock market. Now the problem is after the employment report that we got on Friday, the dollar and yields did rebound higher. Yet that did not stop the rally and the dip buying that's going on in dividend paying names and industrials in the laggards. So again, I say it is too premature to assume that the rotation is actually happening. With that in mind, let's look at some of the charts that we talked about last week and see how they developed. And we start with the ticker DUK Duke Energy. Last week, we said it is overbought. It is due for a rebound. If yields go down, these names will be more attractive and we should see an oversold bounce. Here's the update. We got a bounce. It was not the most impressive one. But again, these are the kind of names that will start to outperform if we have a pause and we have a chase of the underperformers, not the outperformers, not the FOMO. The retail mom and pops do the FOMO. They chase NVIDIA. The institutionals, they buy the dips in the laggards. And if that is the case, if this will be the theme from this point on, then a name like Duke will be a buy. We talked about the XLU in general, the utilities. This is the chart from last week, a daily chart. We said it is oversold. It is putting a reversal pattern, due for a pop, an oversold bounce. We got some of that. Here it is. But is it conclusive? Can you buy this that, okay, we got the bottom and higher we go from here? The answer is not close. It could be a trap. And we looked at at t for example, another name. Here's the chart from last week. Here's the update. We got the rebound, closing the gap, and then came the news on Friday. It's actually fake news, but it doesn't matter. The effect is the same. We got the news from Amazon that now they have prime memberships for phone subscriptions. And that will go against AT&T and Verizon. Here's Verizon, the chart from last week, and we said we could close the gap if the two-year and yields pull back. Indeed, we did close the gap, and then came the massive pullback on Friday due to the Amazon news. When the trade played out, we were looking for closing the gap. We got that exactly. We also looked at the XLP for consumer staples, the daily chart. This is from last week. We said it is oversold. If we have the two-year pulling back, we should see the XLP catching a rebound rally. Here's what we got. Better late than never. Went down a little bit for a few days, then on Friday, it caught a massive bid, and now... The trade is positive. They also shared the chart of ABV, ABBV. Here's what it looked like last week. And again, we were looking at oversold conditions, high dividend paying name. If yields go down, it should catch a bid. Unfortunately for this one, it actually went down even more before catching a bid on Friday. But that was not enough for the trade to be profitable if you entered with a weekly expiration date. Then we talked about the dollar pulling back now that we have a dead deal. And this should excite the dollar sensitive names to move higher. We should see oversold bounces in metals. And I gave you the XME, a daily chart. This is what it looked like last week. And this is the update for the chart. Massive, massive pop. Now again, do you believe it that the XME is popping higher along with the dollar or is it a dead cat bounce? And the dollar is telling the truth. We will see all of these dead cat bounces pulling back. Here's another chart that I shared with you last week for NEM, Gold Miner, 
really sensitive to the dollar. We said it is oversold, due for a rebound. Wait for dividend day on Wednesday and then buy right away in the morning. And here it is. Big pop for NEM. Beautiful to see, but is it a trap? Is it a dead cat bounce? That is a possibility with the dollar moving higher, at least on Friday's session. We also looked at Nike and I said that this is the weakest case. It is sensitive to the dollar, but it is a China story. Here's what the daily chart looked like last week. And here's what it looks like right now. So it went down even more, became even more oversold. And then after dividend paying day, you saw a massive wave of buying and Nike pretty much closed flattish for the week. Nike happens to be one of those names that money managers really love, along with names such as Disney, classic blue chips, and if there is a rotation or a new deployment of capital in buying the stock market by money managers, you bet Nike is going to be a name that they're going to buy. For now, with the dollar rallying on Friday, can you really confirm that this is the bottom, and these names are worthy of buying, or was this just a dead cat bounce? The answer is you don't know, because the dollar is not confirming the move. And of course, in the last video, we talked about the Dylan Mulvaney ETF and we talked about that as an opportunity to buy because it is becoming really really oversold. We talked about names such as Target, TGT, a daily chart, here it is. We said this is a classic bottoming formation as we see the volume changing. We see a green candle. Here's the update on Friday. Nice upside day. Still oversold. Perhaps we have more gains to come, but can you guarantee any of that? The answer is not quite. So you have to be always be closing. Doesn't mean the entire position right away, but at least take some off the table. And then perhaps let some ride. Here's another chart in the Dylan Mulvaney ETF. LULU, Lululemon, daily chart. This is how it looked like last time we covered the chart. Here's the update after earnings. Massive pop. But of course, is it a reversal? Was the action from Lululemon telling that this is a dead cat bounce? That these names will go down sooner than later. Therefore, we say always be closing, at least for now. The market has been thematic. The market has been shape-shifting from week to week to week, and it is confusing. So you cannot really rely on one pattern or one trade for a prolonged period of time. Another name in the Dylan Mulvaney ETF is BUD Bud Light. This is what the chart looked like last time we covered the chart. Here it is, the update. We got a pop on Friday. Still oversold. The volume is rising higher. Perhaps we have more gains to come. Perhaps we go all the way up to the top of the breakdown candle. We'll see. But these are the kind of names that tended to outperform on Friday. Not the NVIDIAs. Not the high runners. Then you look at Disney, another name in the Dylan Mulvaney ETF, DIS. This is what the chart looked like last time we covered it. Here's the update on Friday, big pop higher, out of oversold conditions, but no confirmation in the MACD. So it could be a dead cat bounce, folks, and therefore always be closing. Anyhow, moving on to the market information, we begin with the closing of the indices on Friday, and uh, here we go. The Dow Industrial Average was up by 701.19 points, or a gain of 2.12% on Friday. It was actually the leader for once this year. The Nasdaq was up by 139.78 points, or a gain of 1.07%. S&P also in the green by 61.35 points, or a gain of 1.45%. Look at these sectors on Friday. Green across the board, we're not going to shame anybody. But the gains are led by the laggards. The metals, number one, capturing the gold medal. Number two for the silver, industrials. Number three for the bronze, energy. The laggards on Friday technology and communication services. Why? Because the smart money is rotating from technology and communication services into the laggards. And who's buying technology and communication services right now? The answer is you and I, the retail mom and pops. Unfortunately, of course. When we contrast this with the weekly performance, what do we see here? Number one, capturing the gold medal, cyclicals. Number two for the silver, real estate. Number three for the bronze, technology. In the beginning of the week, it was the old theme, technology, communication services, and some participation by yield-sensitive names such as utilities, real estate. But then by the end of the week, we saw the laggards taking charge. And therefore, when we look at the final result, it is a mixed bag, but it tells a story. At the beginning of the week, certain sectors were lagging, others were winning. By the end of the week, it was a different story. And the question becomes, is it a legitimate rotation or a fake out? We talked about this in details in the intro of this video. But perhaps another important indicator that we have to look at is the breadth of the market. On Friday, the NYSE was a stunning 90 percent advancing versus nine percent declining this makes it almost a sure bet that the nyc will go down in the red on monday at least in the pre-market session the nasdaq was 74 percent advancing versus 23 percent declining so we need 
all of these indices, all of this breadth to go back to neutral. Every time we have an extreme to the upside or the downside, it is followed by a neutral move. When we look at commodities on Friday, what do we see here? Rebound and crude. And of course, we got OPEC Plus on Sunday, meaning today. And Saudi Arabia now has a voluntary cut. It's not an OPEC Plus cut. It's just a voluntary cut. And we see oil moving higher, but it doesn't appear that it is holding gains, at least right now, at the time of the recording of this video. Now, on Friday, the dollar was higher. And the reason is the employment report came out really hot. And therefore, we see precious metals, gold, and silver going down. But then we have the divergence. Why was copper up? Who's lying here? Is it the dollar or copper? This is what we're about to find out this week. And the answer to this question is really important. If copper is not the lying one, if copper is telling the truth, then the rotation holds. And you should be buying the laggards. If copper loses all of these gains, and we see the dollar advancing even more, then we know it was a fake out, it was an oversold bounce, it was just reallocation by money managers in the beginning of the month to chase some performance, and then they dump. Moving on to the options market, the big casino, what do we see here in the action last Friday? The volume all in all is down across the board, but it is heavily concentrated on the largest names. This is what we see the majority of the action, and in these names, the volume was actually higher. And guess what they're buying? The answer is they're buying more calls. They're chasing performances. And this was the wrong call on Friday. In any case, Tesla was the hottest table by far per usual, of course, with about 3.8 million contracts traded on Friday. About 65.5% of those were calls. Apple at number two, with around 1.4 million contracts traded on Friday. About 74% of those were calls. NVIDIA at number three, with around 1.4 million contracts traded on Friday. About 58% of those were calls. We look at the unusual activities that took place on Friday. And again, no major bets, because it's all a formal chase right now. So there are no creative trades but we have some that we can look at. We have a put spread for the SPY. Somebody bought the 375 and they sold the 345 puts the expiration date July 14th with expectations that the SPY will go down and lose more than 12% of its value by then but not more than 19%. They paid about 75 cents a piece for buying the 375 puts. They received in credit about 30 cents a piece for selling the 345s. All in all the entry cost is reduced to about 15 cents a piece bringing the total to about a quarter of a million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker TSLA Tesla? We talked about this name on Friday in the chat room in Discord and I said, look, it is in the market maker's interest to drop Tesla below 200. The problem is, if we see more buying, they're going to get gamma squeezed all the way to 215. And you can find these numbers easily by looking up maximum pain. This time around, maximum pain happened for the dealer. They had to continue to buy Tesla all the way to 215. But with that comes a risk. And the risk here is that the market maker is oversaturated in these shares, meaning they just need to see the beginning clues of a reversal and traders buying puts instead. And then they're going to start dumping shares aggressively. In the meantime, can the squeeze go on for a little more? The answer is of course. And therefore, somebody bought the 227 and a half calls for the expiration date, June 9th, with expectations that Tesla will move higher and gain more than 6% by then. They paid about one buck and 70 cents a piece, standard of this trade, all in all spending about $2 million. And then we have the trade for the ticker QCOM, that stands for Qualcomm. Now it is the laggard among chips. And of course the psychology goes if you missed a Nvidia and Marvell AMD, you're now chasing performance. You're now asking what will be the next Nvidia, the next AMD, the next chip stock that's about to go really hot. And the money managers, the geniuses that they are, they talk to their clients, the clients are mad about Nvidia, it went too high, but the valuations are insane. So the managers say, okay, but the valuation in Qualcomm is pretty good. It's a chip name, it's gonna benefit from the AI mania. And they start buying the name for no specific reason. And then at some point when we hit a wall, and this is about to happen really soon, we look back and say, wait a minute, wh why do we pump Qualcomm? Why do we pump all of these uh, other stocks that were unrelated to NVIDIA? Just because we were chasing what is the next NVIDIA? All of that reckoning has to be sorted out at the same time as players rush to the exit it at the same time and it could be sizable moves to the downside in the meantime a lot of these names are seeing massive inflows it's not a short squeeze it's not a gamma squeeze for the majority of names that's another fantasy it is a stampede it's a lot of money coming from the sidelines and being poured into the stock market this could be due to a pause this could be due to an ai mania who knows but we know that the money managers are now chasing performance in any case 
Somebody bought the 125 calls for the expiration date, June 30. We have expectations that QCOM will go higher and gain more than 8% by then. They paid about one buck and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.2 million. On to the heat map, what do we see here? Green across the board, led by the laggards, metals, banks, industrials, oils, cyclicals, all popping significantly higher. The laggards, led by the winners, the AI mania winners in chips, NVIDIA, AMD, they're not down by a lot, but certainly money is coming out and it's chasing something else. For now, some of the money is in cash, others thinking about buying treasuries, and others, of course, rotating to the losers in the stock market. Now, another losing sector last Friday was telecommunications, led by Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, all damn big. And the reason is we got the fake news that Amazon might be launching a mobile service. Amazon said not happening, but again, buy the rumor, sell the news, or in this case, in Verizon, AT&T's cases, sell the news, buy the rumor. When we contrast this with the weekly performance, what do we see here? Not a lot of differences. It was a good week all in all for the majority of names. We have few exceptions here and there, but it was a green week all in all. There's nothing to see here. Beginning of the month, rebalancing perhaps is it gonna stick that remains to be seen the dollar and yields are not confirming that yet we move on to the weekly heat map for the etfs what do we see here more of an inclusive rally we see the xly leading we see the xrt participating we see the iyr real estate moving higher we see the kre the winner for the week up over six percent we see a more inclusive rally it's not just the large cap growth we have value participating mid caps small caps international markets commodities gold miners gdx silver slv what is the message here things are improving but are things improving based on false pretense that could be the case if the fed flips and says oh well we got the jobs report on friday and uh remember when we said we're gonna skip yeah we're not gonna skip we're gonna do the 25 then you're gonna see the market pulling down right away and the winners from thursday friday will be the losers again on to charts and then we wrap it up when we start with spy the s&p 500 30 minutes chart what do we see here it is sort of a blow off top the rsi says that we're getting really close to a pullback so is the MACD. We're getting toppy here, folks. And of course, the obvious destination would be closing the gap below. But the most important line is 420. That would be main support number one if we have a gap and crap, if we have a flush down right off the gate, a gap down. Then we have to look all the way down to 420 for all of these oversold conditions in the RSI and the MACD indicators to be resolved. We look at the daily chart for the E-mini contracts. What do we see here? This was not a false breakout out of the consolidation range. It managed to close above 42.32. This is a, an important closing. A win if you happen to be bull the market. But we're now looking at resistance at around 4,300. When we look at the RSI, it is firming up. So is the MACD. Is it becoming overbought? The answer is not quite. But we're getting there. In the meantime, there's more room to rally for the SPY. Meaning, if you're going to chase anything right now, if you still want to chase, you got to chase names in the Dow Jones and the S&P and the IWM because those are the laggards. The Qs is not lagging. As you will see in a minute, the Qs is actually becoming really, really overheated. Something that we're not seeing in the chart of the E-mini futures for the SPY. But look at the cash index, a weekly chart for the SPX. We have a closing above 4,200. We have an RSI that is firming up. So is the MACD with plenty of room to go. We can go all the way to 4325.28, but will the chart become overbought enough for a pullback from that point? That remains to be seen. But for now, the SPX is not that overbought yet to merit a pullback and say, okay, the risk versus reward says you got to bet against it. We're not there yet in the SPX. If the risk versus reward suggests anything, it says you might want to chase a little more here when it comes to S&P names, Dow Jones names, IWM names, but that is contingent on confirmations from the dollar and yields. We'll talk about that in a minute, but here it is. Monthly chart for the SPX, any change here? We don't have the confirmation yet in the MACD. We have to wait to see it. Otherwise, this could be a trap, a bear flag pattern, a bearish consolidation pattern, a bear market rally, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter, and then it goes down. So for now, we don't have the confirmation yet. When we look at the Q's 30 minutes chart, what do we see here? It is way overbought. Look at the RSI, look at the MACD, but it is holding for now. If we do have a pullback, we have some soft support at around 352 and a half, but the main support would be down all the way at 348.40. Now, as the market closed on Friday, can we read anything here? Can it tell us 
it's going to go down or up. The answer is not really. It is just consolidating for now. But we know that there is a lot of selling happening in the queues, a lot of profit taking. But the reason why the queues is holding is we have dip buyers showing up from the sidelines. Are they buying at the top? Sure. But is their buying negates the impact, the negative impact of selling by winners? Sure, it can in the short run. But at the end of the day, if the chart continues to go down and we start to see a lot of the institutional winners from the big camps and the AI mania booking profits, then sooner or later, those who chased recently will start to capitulate. And this could result in a flush down, a rug pull, a big red candle that takes us all the way down, let's say to 338.56 or even below. When we look at the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ, what do we see here? You could argue that this is an ABC pattern, but in my opinion, it is a topping formation. Sure, it did close above 14,455, but the momentum indicators are getting really, really overbought. Look at the RSI, look at the MACD indicators. Buying this chart right now, right here, is suicidal. That's what it really is. And we need to go down and retest to 14,000. If that holds, then you should chase. But there is a chance it's not going to hold. And if it doesn't, and down we go on a retest to 13,600, and that doesn't hold, then we're going to have a reversal of the ages. So you got to be really careful here. Now, when we look at the weekly chart for the NDX, what do we see here? Do we have a reversal candle? The answer is absolutely not. We have what it appears to be a saucer bottoming formation that is completed right now. And we can see the RSI getting really, really overbought. So we're waiting for a reversal pattern. If we know anything about the market, it's not going to make it easy for us. Meaning, you're not going to see a reversal candle, a tiny one that will give you the confirmation that yes, here it is, you may short now. I think if it happens, it's going to happen suddenly. It could be via flush down or a gap down in the morning. It happens suddenly. But we know looking at the RSI from the weekly perspective, that the risk versus reward says you're better off booking profits from this chart and start betting against it. Of course, if it pulls back, we have 13,720.91 as the next important support. The bulls would argue that this is not going to stop. We're going to see maybe a little bit of consolidation for a few weeks or so to work those overboard conditions, and then we're up to the races again. The bears would say, no, you ran out of momentum. We're going to get the overboard pulled back, which could take Take us all the way down to 13,720.91. Then we get a rebound and a retest to the resistance of 14,327.26. And that doesn't work out. But we see a 180 again. And it comes as a flush down. It's not going to stop even at 13,720.91. It's going to cut through it like hot knife through butter. When we look at the monthly chart for the NDX. Now we have what it appears to be a confirmation of the MACD that this is indeed a move of bullish momentum and the bulls can look at this as yeah we're gonna just go higher to the moon bra with very little stops and the bullish momentum plays out the bears look at it differently they say that this could be a reverse abc pattern and the c leg will take us all the way down to the original trend line and this b leg is a trap because it is giving us false signals that we should buy but it is actually a trap b leg within an abc pattern we look at the iwm 30 minutes chart what do we see here the winner on friday massive explosion higher we got the gap up look at that candle the first 30 minutes candle a retest at 179.10 it appears to be a gap and crap but then comes the wave of buying algorithmic sure institutional sure market maker sure retail investor sure when you have that many people buying at the same time you get an explosive move like we've seen in the iwm on friday and now we're looking at resistance of 181.96 support at 179.10 does it change anything the answer is a little bit you can look at the weekly chart if you'd like you can look at the monthly chart you can see improvement going on in the iwm the problem is if we look at the hourly or the 30 minutes charts they're becoming really overbought meaning we're due for a pullback in the iwm a bullish outlook would be a pullback to 179.10 or 180 then we see an abc leg it recovers and it moves higher in a retest at 181.96 again but if we see a pullback due to overbought conditions, and the chart loses 179.10. Sound the alarm, it was a dead cat bounce, lots of short covering perhaps, because we do have shorts in the IWM and the KRE, but it doesn't mean a legitimate rotation from the winners to the losers. Moving on to the Dixie 4 hours chart, what do we see here? Number one, the momentum indicators appear to be reversing, but without a confirmation yet, reversing from bearish to bullish momentum, meaning the dollar goes higher, but perhaps it will be via a reverse head and shoulder formation. We see another move higher on Monday, perhaps Tuesday, and then the chart stalls for a little bit. It moves down for a little bit, forming the 
other shoulder and then higher it goes. The bearish outlook would say no, the rebound that we got on Friday is a B leg in a reverse ABC pattern and down it goes again and then we see the continuation of bearish momentum in both the RSI and the MACD. Why is this really important to watch for this week? The answer is if you happen to be a gold trader or even equities trader, you gotta pay attention to the dollar. In the case of gold, the pop on Friday in the dollar was met by a big down day for gold. Look at the RSI, still in negative momentum. Look at the MACD indicator, it is curling back down, indicating there is a risk of breaking 1928 as support. Don't like gold here, we need to see the dollar indeed reversing down in a reverse ABC pattern. Otherwise, the reverse head and shoulder formation could be in play. If that is the case for the dollar, then gold will go down further. SLV Silver, outperforming gold for now, but still down on Friday after a big move in the dollar. Do we have a confirmation on the RSI or MACD indicators? The bearish momentum is over? The answer is not quite. Look at the MACD. For all we know, the SLV could lose 21.57 again and form a lower low. So unless the dollar starts to lose more momentum, you shouldn't buy the SLV right now. You should be watching it if it keeps 21.57 and the dollar indeed reverses back down. Then you should be buying silver. But for now, you should be more of a watcher for this confirmation to happen in the MACD rather than buying ahead of time assuming that that will happen. When we look at UK oil Brent what do we see here below 77 the closing on Friday but keeping the triple bottom so for now the bulls are still alive but the bears are gaining a lot of momentum we look at the daily chart for the two year what do we see here it appears the ABC pattern is on time and if it is sooner or later the C leg will get us above 4.6 in the two year and you gotta assume things will start to be rattled as we head back to the 4.8%, 5%, perhaps even more. You look at the TLT daily chart, what do we see here? Moved all the way to 103 and a half and lost all of the rebound from 100.28. Anything that was assumed to be bullish was negated on Friday. Down it goes for the TLT and the 10 year rebounded higher. Of course, it depends on what the Fed will do. The Fed could ignore all of this and say, yeah, I don't care what the two year did on Friday. We're going to pause or skip either way. Then yields could go down. We'll look at the VIX four hours chart. What do we see here? Once it broke 17 as support, we had to look down to 15 as the next support since the last low did not hold. Now we're below 15. So now we have a classic sign of complacency. When you look at NVIDIA, when you look at the RSIs and the Qs, for example, combined with these readings for the VIX below 15, you put two and two together, we have complacency, we have FOMO, we have chasing at tops, a market reversal is imminent, at least in the big caps. And we could see in that case, in the rug pull scenario for the big caps and the Qs, we could see the VIX popping higher fast. And the first leg will take us all the way back to the range, 17 to 18. The chart will consolidate, gathering some energy in that zone, and then it will pop higher all the way back to 20. Something to keep an eye on. Apple, the big kahuna, an hourly chart, what do we see here? Last week, we talked about the bull flag, and I said you gotta buy Apple as a money manager, at least for the week. Don't chase NVIDIA. Don't chase the mania. Chase the dormant name within big caps and then book profits by the end of the week. And now it appears that we have a bear flag topping formation. It's not conclusive yet. It is without a confirmation. But the risk versus reward says that Apple is going to pull back. And we have pulled back target number one at 177. And pulled back target number two at 175.38. We look at Apple, a weekly chart. What do we see here? Any sign for a reversal? The answer is absolutely not. It is breaking out. It's about to make a new all-time high. But we have two factors we have to weigh in here. Number one, Apple usually rallies ahead of a catalyst and then we see sell the news phenomenon. And the stock been rallying ahead of the revelations of new products by Apple. So once we get them this week, we should see sell the news happening in the stock. And the RSI kind of supports that. It is the same readings from which we've seen pullbacks, major pullbacks in the past. And again, using the weekly chart, could this be a process of a climax top? Just like we've seen back during last summer of 2020, when these big caps names blasted higher aggressively, the last hurrah rally, then they came down, consolidated for a few weeks before resuming moving higher again. And that was during a bull market while the Fed was easing, not tightening. When we look at the monthly chart for Apple, of course, the bears, they like this chart a little more because it supports their outlook of a double top. But if we see Apple trading above these levels and closing above them for the month, then the double top will go out of the window. Tesla, an hourly chart, what do we see here? We still have a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. The problem is, is it becoming really, really overbought? The answer is we're getting there, which means we have a pullback imminent in Tesla. Can it be right now or shall we go to 220 and then pull back? 
That is something that we need to consider. For now, we don't see any sign this is going to pull back right away. So the assumption could be, yes, we have some room to 215, 220, depending on the options contracts. Yet you look at the daily chart, the risk versus reward, looking at the RSI says it's going to pull back. And it's going to retest the breakout line. You're better off here booking profits and arranging shorts. Let's look at some weekly charts for the big caps just to align whether we're there or not when it comes to should we short with both hands. You look at Amazon, still not overbought. We still got plenty of room to go here before the chart becomes overbought. When we look at Google weekly chart, what do we see here? It is overbought, but it could still get a little more absurd. Let's say at around 133.29. It is possible. Could it pull back right now? Yes, it could. But if we go down 117 and lose that support, the assumption is we do have a reversal and a confirmation. But look at the hour size for Amazon and Google. Are they really at that zone above the limit of the RSI where we can say comfortably, yes, the risk versus reward says short right now? The answer is not quite, but we're getting there. Now we we'll look at other names such as Meta. We're already there in Meta. This name is just begging for a rug pull, a flush down kind of move. Then we look at Microsoft. That one is just getting absurd too. You look at the RSI, it is becoming extreme. And now we're looking at the double top potential. So we got Meta Microsoft really overbought. But then on the other hand, you got Amazon, Google. They're not really that overbought. Apple is not really that overbought. When Apple becomes really overbought along with Amazon, Google, yet everything is holding, that would be the moment when we short with both hands. We're getting really close. Now, if we look at NVIDIA, I'm going to look at it from a different angle. I'm going to look at the NVDS index which is the inverse index of NVIDIA. This is a daily chart. What I want to show you is the volume. The chart is way oversold, that's for sure. But we have seen massive volumes coming buying this name in a way to short NVIDIA. This is not a coincidence. This is not, oh, they're going to be wrong. This is they know what they're doing. And they're pouring hundreds of millions of dollars shorting NVIDIA by this index. So instead of buying puts in NVIDIA, you might want to buy calls on this one because it is catching a bit. Now we look at it from the weekly perspective and the evidence is clear. Look at this massive candle from last week. Insane amount of volume, hundreds of millions of dollars buying this index right here, betting that NVIDIA is indeed marking the top and it is in the process of a nasty reversal. Last but not least, we'll look at Bitcoin. What do we see here in Tulips? Still within the consolidation zone, but it is holding at 26,555 for support. The momentum indicators are inconclusive, although they're kind of leaning a little bit bullish for now. And the reason is RSI is not in negative divergence anymore. Maybe it's going to go down there at some point, but for now it is positive. And the same can be said about the MACD. Of course, the bearish scenario is this is a bear flag consolidation pattern. We see the loss of momentum coming. And then finally, a clean break below 26,555. That would be a massive shorting signal. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have in the economic calendar this week? Monday, June 5th, we have the services PMI, factory orders, along with ISM services. Wednesday, June 7th, we have the U.S. trade deficit, along with consumer credit. And lastly, on Thursday, June 8th, we have initial jobless claims, along with wholesale inventories. A reminder, it's going to be a slow week from the macro perspective. And we have uh, no Fed zombies speaking anymore. We're in the quiet period now. Now, traditionally, this is supposed to be good for the stock market. The lack of macro events and Fed talkers makes the path of least resistance higher. And I want you to watch for the durability in the rotation that we've seen, especially on Friday. Will the industrials hold? Will the Chinese names hold? Metals, banks. And if they do, good news. So far, so good. But if they start to reverse really fast, then we got a problem. Because it means all what we got last week was a mere dead cat bounce in certain names. Now they're not oversold anymore. And oh, by the way, the Qs is actually overbought along with the AI mania. Now it's their turn to go down. And they will take down everything with them. And now you see that this week is really important. Regardless of the fact that we don't have a lot of macro and a lot of Fed. But anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. Something is not kosher here. I'm, Something. No, it's all kosher. It's I think it's not kosher. I think it's total bullshit. That's what I think. It's hitting me the wrong way. Something is wrong here.